Welcome to uh, this virtual solution series a special event, a series we've been continuing since uh, the COVID lockdown, a special Wednesday uh, series where we have uh, updates on uh, various uh, center related events. But today is a virtual event update on restarting the economy. Uh, Mark Harmsworth, our Center Director for Small Business, uh, will be joining us and uh, will also speak with the House Minority Leader, J.T. Wilcox, and the Pierce County Executive, uh, Bruce Dammeyer, uh, coming up as part of the panel. But first, I thought what we would do is speak with Mark Harmsworth, our Small Business Director, about a publication that he released this past Monday. Um, as I said, this is a special series of events, pardon the train, and we'll have uh, additional events coming up next week. Next Wednesday is a special YP event where they'll uh, host the Tri-Cities Happy Hour, um, and this will be an evening event. It's uh, next Wednesday on the 20, uh, 20th, uh, 7 to 8 p.m. Um, your, a link will be sent to you upon registration. They're going to talk about the economic outlook and the future of the Tri-Cities and the Hanford area. Uh, and then the following week, our Ag um, Center Director, as well as our Transportation Center Director, uh, will be joining us uh, to talk about um, the impact on uh, of the COVID shutdown on agriculture uh, and on transportation and other related issues. So be sure to sign up and register for those free events as well. Mark, um, your piece uh, that uh, was published on Monday dealt with recommendations on how to help families and businesses recover. Um, what's the most What's the most basic thing, as you were looking at this issue, what's the most basic thing public officials need to understand to be ready to jumpstart the economy and get things uh, rolling again? Uh, well, thanks, Dave, for uh, hosting us today. I appreciate it. Um, one of the things that I think that really jumps out is the um, property tax deferrals that we've seen from some of the counties and from the, and hopefully some of the cities as well, and then B&O taxes at the state level. Uh, where we're able to uh, give those businesses that right now may not be generating any revenue um, the ability to just stretch their budgets just a little bit further. They've got uh, payroll they may be able to pay right now. If they are, that's great. If not, they're, a lot of their employees are obviously taking unemployment benefit. But anything we can do to stretch this out so that when we restart, uh, we want to start this thing quickly and then start looking at the ways that we can either defer or reduce some of these taxes that are on these businesses because if you think about a restaurant as an example that we're hoping to see open here shortly um, they've got to go they first of all they lost a lot of perishable food that had to be thrown out now they're going to have to go out and buy a lot more food uh, before they can even open the doors to fill the menu so um, being able to be able to do that give them as much flexibility as they can from from a state county city perspective is very important what about the the challenge of um, getting consistent measures so that, you know, let's say uh, there's consistent health and safety requirements, so social distancing and safety requirements that could be applied uh, throughout. That was one of your recommendations. What, what are the what are the basic challenges there? Oh, well, each industry is different, um, but if we can come up with a standard set of recommendations across the board, and, and it's not difficult. I mean, most folks are thinking about this, you know, the, the, the distancing requirements, um, you know, coughing into your arm if you have a cough, staying home if you're sick, and those types of things. We can apply that fairly equally across different uh, industries. You think right now you'd be able to go to the store and buy food, but we can't go to other types of stores that are currently closed, uh, opening up soon, and applying that consistency. And that is what small business really needs, is a consistent, um, predictable approach so it knows what to do and how to do it and not make this overly complex. We've seen recommendations on some of the uh, contact distancing, as an example, where that's gonna be extremely onerous, and to some degree, you know, a lot of people aren't gonna be wanna give in their personal information to uh, folks at the restaurants and, and other places, car, um, car dealers for another industry that has to uh, collect that information. So uh, keep it simple, keep it concise, and keep it consistent across these different industries is gonna help these uh, these industries get rolling much, much faster. One of the things that's um, increasingly coming up is the hit to the state budget that's going to occur and that um, there'll be new challenges for the state in dealing with that. Um, there's some talk of, you know, of course, for some, that's a, a chance to increase taxes. Uh, but if businesses are struggling or going bankrupt um, or just barely getting off the ground, it's going to be tough to tax what doesn't exist. 
So what needs to happen tax wise? What's the basic approach uh, you would recommend for policymakers? Well, deal with um, challenges of revenue. Right. Um, so for for our small business owners, and uh, when I served in the legislature, I actually ran a bill that did this. Um, it was to defer those B&O taxes for the first few years of a small business when it became a small business, so they could get off the ground and, and get things moving again. But that's really what it's about. Um, I own a small business. I've been thankfully able to pay my B&O taxes over the last uh, month and so, and I've done that. Um, and uh, but for some it's it's difficult and so uh, giving them the flexibility um, without penalties to either defer or hold back on some of those so that they can keep their budgets and get people back to work um, and give some flexibility in some of these deadlines that need to be uh, completed each month and every every quarter when we're filing all these different um, fees to the state. Is, I think real, I, is, that, is that realistic you think in terms of um, you know, the, 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 there'll be a tendency to say we got to maximize revenue. And uh, for, for many, it'll be a tough sell to say, well, what you need to do is actually defer or, um, or forgive uh, or eliminate certain entire tax brackets uh, for a period of time until business can recover and, and is able to actually uh, pay those things. So, um, it, yeah, it's, it's going to be difficult for the state. I think um, another thing that they could be doing um, is looking at regulatory regulatory reform to try and streamline and make things easier. We've seen some of this already. We've relaxed some things during COVID, which has helped businesses get things done a lot faster. Um, never did I think I would be able to go get a margarita and to go. That was a, that's a new thing in this state. But um, you know, we've helped out some businesses here. But uh, there's things like that that we can be looking at. Coming up with a list of simple things that to say, hey, we're just going to see how this works. We're going to you know, let people who, I mean, most Washingtonian, Washingtonians here and, and businesses, they're doing the right thing. They're trying to do the right thing here and they're, they're applying the right safety regulations. They're keeping themselves and their customers and their employees safe. They want to get back to business. They're, they're not looking for that big heavy hand. They're just looking for that guidance uh, so they can get out there and uh, actually start working again. So one of the big challenges, I think, is uh, we there seems to be this kind of uh, false dichotomy happening where people are saying you either prioritize health or you prioritize the economy, and it's not necessarily an either or, um, and and one depends heavily on the other, um, or both depend on each other actually in many ways. So here um, for those of you who have just joined us or have been with the program since the beginning, um, I was speaking with Mark Harmsworth, the Washington Policy Center. Center for Small Business Director about his latest publication. It was just released on Monday, How State Officials Can Help Families and Small Businesses Recover When the Economy Opens Up. There's a link to that in your uh, toolbox section, your go to webinar toolbox section. You'll see it right there up in the handouts section on the right-hand side of your screen um, in all likelihood. Uh, also on the right-hand side, you'll see a questions uh, place under the uh, near the chat function. Um, if you have a question at any point during this webinar, just enter it there. I'll be compiling those and assembling them for the Q&A uh, time after the basic presentation. That'll be coming up at about uh, 35 minutes after the hour. Um, so Mark will be uh, will be introducing his panel and uh, talking with both um, our uh, minority leader in the House, J.T. Wilcox, and Pierce County Executive Bruce Dammeyer here for uh, for about 15 minutes, and then we'll get to the Q&A section. So you can either enter your questions into the toolbox there, the GoToWebinar toolbox, um, or you can email them to me directly, dbose uh, at washingtonpolicy.org. That's D uh, as in David, B as in boy, O, Z as in zebra, E as in egg, dbose at washingtonpolicy.org, and I'll check my email as well. With that, I'd like to turn that over to Mark. When I reappear, I'll just be a voice uh, in the uh, from, from the beyond, um, and uh, and we'll we'll uh, guide you through the question and answer period. Uh, Mark, you want to introduce the panel and uh, get the program started? Yeah, thanks, uh, David. Uh, well, I'm very pleased to uh, have uh, Minority Leader uh, J.T. Wilcox join us today, and uh, Pierce County Executive Bruce Danmeyer, and uh, they've been with us before. Uh, today it's great to see JT. We managed to fix our uh, technical difficulties from last time, so it's good to see him, and uh, he's enjoying his ranch there at home. And Bruce, it looks like you've been working hard in the office all day today too. So uh, thanks very much for joining us today. 
I've got a, a couple of questions. I'm just going to throw them out here before we go out to audience questions here in a little bit. So to give you guys time to send in the things that are top of mind for you. Um, we've been it's been a couple of weeks since we've got together here and a lot has changed obviously in the last two weeks as far as covid um jt what do you think um the the odds are of us seeing a session special session where that's going to go and what do you think the criteria that you would like to see is before we start going down that road because i believe we're going to have to have some kind of budget cuts it was good to see the governor today saying hey let's put a freeze on those increases at the state level, I know a lot in the private sector have already gone through that, or if not, even lost their jobs. So uh, we, uh, we're we facing a significant budget deficit. So I wanted to get your opinion on that. Well, the date that has been thrown around almost since the beginning is uh, end of June. A uh, couple of reasons for that. First of all, you have a regular uh, revenue forecast due then. And we've got an informal one now that is pretty sobering. And if you follow revenue forecasts at all, you know that they don't reverse themselves very often. They generally start in one direction and just keep going in that direction. And so uh, we're down, you know, probably six or seven billion now over four years, and I would expect it to be that or more um, by June. Uh, I think another really large data point that we'll know something more about is what are caseloads going to be like? Uh, you know, caseloads have declined because of the recovery. Uh, and in some cases, uh, the cost per person has gone up, but uh, because the numbers were down, uh, that actually helped our budget outlook quite a bit. Not going to be the case this time. We're probably uh, going to be facing those higher costs per person and multiplying that by a much higher uh, number as we look at all the people that are uh, becoming dependent on government as a result of the government reaction to COVID. And then the last thing that's the biggest and likely to be the most contentious is what kind of a contribution will the feds be making? Uh, at this point, I got a text message from Patrick McMorris Rogers uh, reminding me that it was almost $4 billion at this point, and only a small part of that has been dispersed to local governments. Uh, I don't know what the precise uh, strings attached to those are. Uh, I believe that it is supposed to be for COVID-related uh, expenses only, and uh, how broadly that can be described, I'm, I'm not sure at this point. I'm not sure that people in uh, the governor's office are going to define that just as widely as they possibly can. And then there's also a demand now on the part of the Western States Coalition, uh, a group that is uh, Democratic states only, uh, asking for a trillion dollars. And uh, I, I didn't sign on to that one, not because I don't think the feds have a role in this, but I felt like uh, that was more of a political request than it was uh, something that was a serious matter of budgeting. And we've got to be super careful about something. Right now, we've got a catastrophe brewing uh, from the grassroots up because the reaction to COVID by state governments is destroying the economy. Um, we I think have the threat of a different kind of catastrophe that starts from the top down, as uh, there is uh, essentially no bottom line anymore in national budgeting, and we're embarked on an experiment and nobody knows what the results are gonna be, and we in our economy are the uh, subject of that experiment. So those of us that maybe don't have responsibility at the federal level, I think still have a responsibility to try to be as realistic as we can. Uh, Executive Demai, what have you seen at the county level as far as budget impacts uh, to your services, your ability to provide services over the last two weeks? And what are you thinking as we start to reopen here? Uh, what is it that you're going to be focused on in the next uh, couple of weeks? You know, Mark, you may not know this, but but my grandfather started our family printing business in 1934. So we grew that business out of the recession and we're still in printing today. So we've seen world wars, multiple recessions. And my dad always told me the key, if you're smart, you come out of a downturn, out of a challenge, stronger and better position for the future. That's the key. You got to be, that's the challenge is to be that smart. And we're applying that here in Pierce County. I, I would echo a couple of the things that, 
that uh, Representative Wilcox said, the, the first is, you know, right now we don't know when this stops, right? I, I can't tell you when we're out of the stay at home order. I can't tell you when business is back to normal in Pierce County. You know, it, we don't know when the vaccine is gonna come, which is the key to probably getting back to the most normal we'll ever get to. So there's a lot we don't know. The other thing that we don't know is, as he also, as he indicated, what's the federal response gonna be? Will there be more relief coming? Will there be more money coming from the feds? Those are two big variables that we don't know. But based on what we do know today, as I look forward, um, Pierce County is better positioned than most governments. We have been, uh, we're, we budget very conservatively. We have been building our reserves specifically for a potential downturn. We have not grown our, uh, our payroll and our ongoing expenses. We really focus on kind of using very conservative and, and smart uh, budgeting practices. We leverage kind of one-time expenses for productivity enhancements things like that. So right now we are not in the same situation as dire as you're seeing at the county and at the in many of the cities where they're so heavily dependent on sales tax and business and occupation tax, which are so responsive to the economy. 60% of our tax base comes from property tax, which is the most stable. So as I look forward, the key for Pierce County is we're going to go through a tough time. Our, our residents are going to need us now more than ever. One of the things that is crazy to me is when you, as when I was down in Olympia, when you'd see spending go up crazily and then build all these programs that then have to be gutted when the economy turns down. So we're trying to do things very differently. We are projecting kind of a significant downturn between now and certainly in 2020. But we believe <clears throat> that by spending some of our excess reserves, by tightening our belt kind of quite a bit and making some kind of modest across the board reductions, uh, that we can get by without doing any of the draconian kind of layoffs or furloughs. At this point, we will be doing some surgically department by department. But our focus is to make sure that Pierce County is there to support the people of Pierce County when they need us most and the services that we provide them. So I, right now I'm cautiously optimistic that we're not gonna see the same level of severity that you're seeing at the state and at, the, at some of our cities. Uh, sort of a follow-up question. Um, the unemployment fund has been going down in, in, uh, in its balance. Uh, we've been getting uh, very vague numbers out of the, the state ESD department on the, the, the balance as it is right now and how the money's been spent, whether it's federal dollars or, or state dollars. Um, the bottom line, though, is um, that fund is going to be down significantly when we're through this, and we're going to have to replace that money. Um, JT, what are your, uh, rep excuse me, Representative Wilcox, no. what are your uh, thoughts on uh, how uh, the governor will respond to that and what he may propose and what you might see in, in session to try and replace some of that funding, plus the shortfall that we're likely to see in our in our state budget. Well, first of all, um, that is not the most immediate problem that we have uh, with employment security. The, the immediate catastrophe is that there are at least tens of thousands of people that have been out of work for quite some time and still haven't been able to penetrate uh, the limitations of the website and the system. And so I know that they are absolutely absorbed in trying to do that as well they should, because these people that have no income now uh, are uh, through no fault of their own are going to be going hungry and they're gonna be crashing uh, the real estate uh, system as well and, and uh, mortgage finance. So they have to work on that. They also appear to be in the middle of a fraud um, challenge. Uh, I have heard recently uh, about businesses that uh, are finding that many of their working employees have been claimed for um, uh, unemployment. And uh, this looks like an organized fraud effort and uh, employment security is going to have to deal with that as well. Uh, 
I believe I understand that there is an automatic system set up for federal loans for um, you know replenishing these funds. And so I would imagine that the governor's office is, I don't mean to put them down in this, I'm thinking that they're dealing with immediate catastrophes rather than how are we gonna refill it? But it is a darn important question because if we try to refill it uh, back to a safe level by increasing rates on the businesses that survive this catastrophe, uh, we will just be designing the next catastrophe. And I think there is some general understanding among certainly Republicans and I've heard it from uh, the Democrats that engage with business to some extent that uh, there's going to have to be some immediate relief uh, so that businesses, especially small ones, can get back on their feet uh, without uh, big liabilities that mean that they don't have the cash flow even to uh, replenish inventory. And uh, yes, yeah, budget, budget deficits, uh, you know, the you were in the legislature, Mark, uh, when we were still dealing with a little bit of the fallout from uh, the Great Recession. And of course, uh, Bruce was there a couple years before I was. You know that, that the budget deficit hits a little later um, for the government than it does uh, for business. So you have a little time to think about it. But one of the really scary things is we've added some really, really large entitlement programs, uh, like uh, much larger financial aid programs. Uh, and whenever you add a um, entitlement program, you guarantee that the courts will not let you make adjustments in that program. And so we have even less flexibility then, uh, now, than we did then. Uh, and so I think the programs that were recently stood up um, and were financed by the $10 billion in additional taxes that were passed uh, in the last two sessions, uh, are never ever going to get an opportunity to get off the ground and all the initial investment in those things are going to be wasted. Uh, on top of that, uh, one of those taxes was recently uh, thrown out uh, because it was unconstitutional, so there's a resource that's not available either. Uh, so I think that uh, you're going to see, uh, I think, a lot of stress on the other side of the aisle. Um, and uh, when we do have a special session, I, I doubt that there's going to be a lot of taxes involved because it's going to be right before an election. Um, but if you look at what's happening with the, the next proposed uh, relief bill in the House, this is an agenda bill. Uh, I think I saw that the number is proposed to be $3 trillion, which used to be a lot of money. Uh, and it is a full implementation of a progressive agenda. And, um, you know, I think that that's one thing that we've got to look out for. Uh, are, are we going to solve our problem and get our economy back on our back on its feet, or are we going to implement somebody's maximum agenda? You, you know, Mark, I'd like to jump in there a second because because timeliness is important here, right? When I I read this morning that that the Employment Security Department thought they would have all the unemployment claims processed by mid June. By mid June, that's just it, people are desperate for those. You know, they've been unemployed. They've been unemployed since March. So that's just crazy in my mind. And that goes to one of the things that, at the county level, what we're trying to do is act quickly and nimbly to kind of protect and support our small businesses and our and our residents as they're struggling. Some great examples of that. Uh, the we were the recipient of $158 million in federal CARES Act funding. And our focus is to get that money out as quickly and as effectively as possible. Uh, we got a lot of latitude from our county council in doing that. So we've got about $67 million of that that's focused to our public emergency response, including making sure we are prepared and protected against the second wave to make sure we don't get back there again. But we've got $30 million focusing on small business, on economic revitalization and stabilization. And that's where we're going in with not only kind of small business loans and forgivable loans quickly, available now. We've been doing this for a little bit, but, but getting that money available to them now, but getting it to them July isn't helpful. They need it right now to bridge that gap, particularly until state or federal money comes online. We're, we're standing up consulting groups that can help 
private businesses get to develop their reopening plans so they can meet the requirements, know how to do that safely. We've got 22,000 thermometers on board so or on order so that those businesses can have that. We're ordering masks to support our businesses getting back online. That is absolutely crucial. At the same time, we've got another kind of uh, $22 million focusing on our community response and uh, revitalization. And some of that is going in particular towards rental assistance. But at this point, we've got to keep our housing market as healthy as we can. And that means for those folks who've, some of those folks who've lost their jobs, that may mean us providing a direct payment in their behalf to their landlord to keep that environment healthy. But timeliness is important. And that's normally not something that government does quickly. They're generally, uh, the federal government always lands big but slow. So our county is working on being kind of very strategic and surgical and nimble and quick. And for those small businesses, I assume they just reach out to your office and you'll give them a hand. Absolutely, our economic development team is there kind of full-time, they're processing, and the, and the applications are not very hard to fill out. It's, it's like 10 questions and we get, we get it done. Awesome. Mark, I, I just want to point something out here. You know, every business crisis I've ever been involved in, and I've been involved in a lot, I come from a very volatile uh, business background, and, and I'll just share a story like Bruce did. Uh, we've got five generations in our business now, and now I tell people every generation has come within a week of losing the business, the farm and the family and everything, and then every generation has had the opportunity to rebuild it. And what you learn is the first thing that you have to do is have liquidity in your balance sheet, because without liquidity, uh, no options are possible. And then you immediately and quickly, swiftly go to what, what are the scarce resources? You know, which isn't always money. It can be uh, over the road capacity. It can be uh, staff. It can uh, be just a, a whole variety of things. In some cases, it's technology. And, and you try to clear those roadblocks as quickly as you can. And to hear somebody who is running the second largest government in Washington uh, just makes me so happy. And Doug on it, Bruce, uh, I'm, I'm glad to be your friend. And we're lucky to have you talking like that. I, I hope that we can get you a bigger megaphone because that will be good for all levels of government here in Washington to understand it's not, it's not government and business. We can't have one without the other. Uh, and to even think that you can is to court disaster. Yeah. So I have one Very last much. question, one last question for you, and then I'm going to uh, turn it over to Dave for audience questions here. Um, yesterday, uh, the guidance came out from the governor's office on uh, contact tracing in restaurants. Um, our position has been at the policy center, you know, simple, uh, easy to follow, consistent um, guidelines for all business types uh, with nuances, depending on your business type, obviously. But um, yeah, leave it up to the business owners to try and uh, keep their customers themselves safe. It would seem that uh, the contact distancing, while in theory um, it, it, the, the, goal, the goal is laudable in that we're trying to you know, reduce the amount of infections and we're, we're obviously all about that. But the, the, the issue there really is about privacy and safety, um, uh, you know, personal privacy, excuse me. Um, and, and having restaurants collect this information from its customers and then give it to the state just seems like an overreach uh, of uh, the constitutional authority of the state. Um, from a local level, um, Bruce, if you want to comment that, and then JT, from your perspective, if uh, you would be encouraging the governor maybe to not do that quite so egregiously. So I guess one of the things is kind of what's your philosophical approach? And we've recently kind of had to, had to wrestle with that here in Pierce County. There's a lot of there's a lot of folks you saw that King County just did uh, kind of a masking requirement from the county and the and the city out to kind of everybody in the county. And, and uh, we approach things I, we approach things differently here in Pierce County. We believe that if you communicate clear and accurate medical information to our people, that they are that you can trust them to make the best decision for their their families and their communities well-being 
And I think the data in COVID kind of bears that out in Pierce County. We're the second largest county in the state. We happen to share a border with King County, yet right now we're, the, we're number four in terms of COVID cases and deaths. And I hope we stay that way. And I'm not, we just got passed by Yakima and I feel sorry for Yakima County. They're going through a tough time. But I think that's because we've taken some early action. So we have some smart policies in play and we've got folks who given the right information will do the right things. That's why when we're talking about masking, you know, I say that in Pierce County, we're going to the department heads to look at their employees, their interaction with the public and the jobs that they do in protecting the community. Let them make the best decision at that local level. It's the same thing with businesses. Businesses, they, the vast majority of them really appreciate their customers and their employees and want to do the right thing by their community. Their business livelihood is at stake with all three of those. So I think if you give them the right support and the right information and medically accurate, good information, they're going to make good decisions around that. They want to protect all three of those groups. Now, will there be an exception? Absolutely. There are bad actors everywhere, but you deal with the bad actor as a bad actor. You don't try to punish the whole system. You don't treat everybody like they're bad actors. And again, it's about clear, accurate in medical information and trust folks to use that well and to take care of themselves, their families, their community, and their business. Well, you can tell Bruce and I have a lot in common and a lot of, of background uh, that's in common too, because uh, I, I've often told people I've never once in my life, whether I was taking over a new processing plant or, or being involved in politics, had been let down when I was honest with people, let them know that I didn't know a lot uh, and ask them sincerely for their help. And uh, I think that is a great lesson in business. It's a, it's a tougher lesson in politics because you've got the, the partisan aspect, but when leaders in a crisis are willing to do that with the people that they uh, are elected to lead, I think they will be far more successful than when you try to do it with compulsion and um, you know force and uh, I've got a record of text messages into the governor's office for about six weeks now where I am consistently making the point uh, we have to make this make sense because in the end the only hope that you have to be successful and we want we want the governor to be successful in protecting people in Washington as long as we're also protecting them in every other way not just the disease, um, we have to prove to them that the things that we're doing that are hard for them are actually going to contribute to their health and they're going to be applied fairly and they're going to have an element of choice. And uh, I, I think that uh, maybe the first month uh, there was a problem with not really adjusting quickly enough when it became apparent that things were not um, as good as they could be. Uh, and maybe I'm soft peddling this a little bit. It, it's obvious to everyone how inconsistent some of the original rules were. And I think it was a big mistake not to adjust those more quickly. Uh, but I also think I'm seeing some indications that uh, there is uh, a little more explanation taking place. And uh, I, I do know that these uh, rules that are being applied to uh, the food service industry are considered by both the Hospitality Association and the governor's office as a work in progress. And uh, I, I think that uh, as they begin to understand the perverse incentives that uh, can be created, for example, if you uh, have draconian consequences for being tested positive and um, testing becomes mandatory, who the heck is going to be tested if they can help it? Uh, I had a cousin uh, this morning who's a doctor tell me, well, we're kind of worried that at some point they'll use um, antibody testing as a requirement for work. And won't that mean that everybody who's healthy will go out and try to get infected because their job is so important to them? So uh, we just need to take these things that epidemiologists know are important and figure out how can we accomplish these in ways that uh, people will do in a voluntary way because they understand it and it makes sense to them and really avoid these things 
that just automatically make people lose their trust. And I think this, anything that sounds like a database right now uh, is, uh, is a big problem. We're already sensitive to that. And uh, I know that there is some thought that maybe there's a, uh, a less intrusive way of doing that. And maybe we shouldn't make our businesses be responsible for enforcing uh, the governor's rules on their, um, on their customers. Uh, and I'm, I'm hopeful that we're going to start using uh, human nature here in a little more useful way. Dave, um, what do you have on the line? All right, I'm going to start with a question that's pretty specific to an individual business, but I think it applies to concerns from um, from a lot of businesses that might have unique situations. The question is, there's a very popular drive-in movie theater that's about to close permanently if it's not allowed to reopen. Do you think there's a way to move it out of the regular movie theater designation so that it could safely open? Hmm. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, I and mean, that's that's all I mean, about yeah. applying the rules consistently, right? And in, in that if you're able to isolate in your car in a drive-in movie, you should be able to go to the movie. It's not like when you're in a theater. Uh, again, I would say the issue should be, can you keep your employees safe? Can you keep your customers safe? Can you keep the community safe? If you've got a plan to do that, you should be able to open. Nobody in their right mind thinks... The, the, the plan and the way to do that in a movie theater is the same way you would do that in a drive-in theater. It, it just doesn't make any sense. Yeah, I was just on a, a joint broadcast with Larry Springer, uh, deputy uh, majority leader in the House, and he's, he's made them the same point that these uh, categories, you know, are perhaps a little hastily drawn and a little arbitrary. and we need we need to have a better system for evaluating safety rather than just you know what box do you fit in. And I have talked with uh, the director of the Department of Commerce, Lisa Brown, and I am hoping that she is becoming more influential uh, in our whole recovery effort because she does get that. Uh, and I know that there are other organizations, trade organizations in Washington, that are really trying to. Uh, help create a set of rules that can be quickly implemented by the governor's office so that if you can be safe, doesn't matter, you know, what next code your employees are under, uh, you can operate. Next question. A great deal of fraudulent claims have been made to unemployment. How will the state resolve these issues? You know, I, I, I wish that I had a role in the you know, in that department, uh, I, I think it, it is becoming a, a serious concern while they're still trying to solve the problem uh, of an overloaded system. And the two problems are probably connected. Um, we're not even allowed, believe it or not, as legislators uh, to uh, call um, employment security directly now because that might somehow slow their effort to fix their system. So this is a kind of a catastrophic collapse uh, and it's caused by an immense increase in volume uh, that I think even a private company would have trouble handling. Um, and the governor's office and the executive branch are going to have to fix it. It's nothing that Bruce or, or a legislator can do. So in Pierce County, we've had a little under 20 of our employees showing up on the as filing for unemployment including one of my top department heads obviously fraudulently and one of the questions that we're asking ourselves is how can we support them in you know how can we be part of making sure that ESD knows it's a fraudulent claim and, and I'll tell you it's a challenge for us to get through to them as well so and, and it is amazing how much time it has taken for this you know one of my top Lieutenants, you know, heading up our planning and public works function, how much time he has spent of his time trying to get through to the Employment Security Department and let them know it's fraudulent. That's a concern. We, we would, I would be very clear, there's no evidence of any data breach in Pierce County. Our systems are solid. That's not where this came from, those, those 20. Uh, as far as we can tell, the data seems to all be probably from some of those retail hacks of a couple of years ago because at least in the ones that we have seen 
The data they're using to apply, it seems to be stale. It may have an old name or an old address or something like that. Unfortunately, they've got the social security number and the birth date right, which makes uh, all the problem in applying for unemployment. So this is, a, this is a key issue. When I look at, one of my challenges when I'm on the outside and, and when I'm looking at any system as a, as a you know, businessman, um, one of the challenges you gotta recognize when you're dealing with a spike and that the solutions to deal with a spike are different than the solutions to deal with a fundamental change in the volume you're gonna deal with. I think this is a spike. And I, so I get concerned when I hear ESD talking about hiring a bunch of people to process it. Well, it takes a long time to hire people. That's, a, that's not a quick process today. So I, I'm hoping that they are um, working aggressively to get other, you know, contract, get other call centers, get other resources that can be applied quickly and strongly as opposed to just hiring more people for what will likely be a dramatic spike that it goes down very quickly. Once those, once that spike, that surge in unemployment gets processed, I hope we go back to something normal. If we don't, we're in a lot bigger trouble than any of us can get ourselves out of. And it would seem that after all this is over, obviously we need to take a look at this and figure out a way of authenticating those claims quickly, efficiently in the future, so that uh, should we see another spike, that we've got a better way of handling this to prevent this. And that will fall on uh, a legislator's lap, I suspect. We're not going to chip you. <laughs> Next question for JT. Will the legislature try to amend the law to extend 30-day four-corner approval for all emergency orders by the governor? Uh, boy, yeah, I think that there's going to be a major effort to do that. And I'm glad somebody answered this because it lets me uh, clarify one thing. Uh, the law gives the governor the power to do the uh, emergency order and extend it himself uh, without any legislative approval. It also uh, allows him to do his stay at home orders uh, and extend them himself with no legislative input. There's a, a smaller subset of suspensions of law that uh, the legislature uh, does sign on to, and we sign on to most of those because most of them are waivers of regulations, and I'd love to continue to do that for a lot longer than 30 days. But uh, I guarantee you that there will be an effort, at least uh, from uh, the two Republican caucuses, to take a major look at how um, emergencies are run. I, I, didn't, I never want to spend another day of my life uh, under emergency orders. Uh, it causes so much distrust, uh, and I'm sure it would be true for any governor. Uh, it is not the way Americans were born to be ruled. And uh, I want uh, the next time this happens, there to be a much more collaborative process that people uh, can see some buy-in with. And there will be, uh, you know, more voices involved. And, and it certainly shouldn't, unless conditions dictated, it shouldn't be run out of Camp Murray, you know, when there's no military component to this. Next question, um, Executive Danmeyer, are you finding your local health district open to the concept of safe business plans with the three criteria you described, or are they in lockstep with the governor's phased approach and only looking at plans that are released from the governor's office? JT, is the process of approving businesses happening in the legislative task force still, or was that disbanded? You wanna go first, Bruce? Sure, so in Pierce County, uh, one of the things we are doing is actively as, as you know, we're, we're a, so our health department is an independent agency. They're not part of Pierce County government. They're a separate uh, agency, uh, but we are, particularly with the county where we've got the CARES Act funding and we're looking at trying to help our community recover as quickly as possible and get in and have impact as quickly as possible one of the questions that we have asked is that with them is what are the key measures that we need to see in our community for safe reopening? So what's happening at the state is important, but what's happening in our community is more important. We don't want to be driven necessarily by kind of what's happening in 
Snohomish County, we want to be driven by what's happening in Pierce County, keeping our community safe and helping our community recover as quickly as possible. So those are the things we're talking about with our health department and hope that we can get those kind of individual plans worked out. We, uh, but we'll see how it is. The, the, the public health community is pretty tight on a statewide level right now. I forgot the question for me. What was it? It was, let's see here. Let me see if I can find it now. I've been scrolling through so many. Oh, uh, let's oh, see. It was about the legislative task force. If you, uh, oh, if that was that, disbanded. That was, dis that was disbanded last week. The governor. Kind of very short notice and boom, they're not going to do it anymore. That, and that's a decision within the control of the executive branch. Where's the disconnect with the common sense approach, as you described, with consistency across uh, the business spectrum? I, I think the question is basically a follow up for your commentary about needing consistency and just saying if you can keep customers, the community and employees safe and you have specific um, metrics or protocols to follow, why why can't um, you know, why can't that approach basically be implemented immediately so that more people could earn a living? Well, this is under control of the executive and um, I wish I knew the answer to that question. Uh, again, I've got a, a text message stream with uh, my contact in the governor's office where we talk about this. Uh, and um, I, I, I think that this process has been driven by public health. And uh, you know, if you are an executive in public health, you really do only have one job. Your job is to take care of the health of the public. And you don't, you know, you're, no one hires you to be concerned about the economy, about people's jobs, about the survival of businesses. Uh, that, you know, the idea that you have to consider lots of different issues and you have to manage competing priorities, that, that's for elected leaders to do. And I think up until very recently, there was not a lot of voice for jobs, business, and the economy uh, in the emergency management system that we have in Washington. And I, I do believe that that's changing a little bit now, uh, but the fact that, that that didn't seem to be a component, and understand, I'm guessing here, oh, nobody's actually told me this, but I have been observing and I'm calling around as learning as much as I can, um, I, I think, we, we actually are quite behind in this state uh, because even though we may reach a point in the disease when it's possible to uh, you know, have some broader activities, we're not ready with the rules to do that. And we also were stuck in this uh, essential versus non-essential paradigm uh, much longer than it made sense. Uh, it, it would have made a lot more sense, I think, to transition quickly to, okay, what can you do safely? So I would say that I think there's a fundamentally a philosophical difference of approach. Right now out of Olympia, you're seeing everybody, every business, every business group has got to go to Olympia individually to try to lobby, make the case, negotiate a plan, that they can then use to try to go open some of their businesses. Again, my approach is kind of fundamentally the opposite. The key is provide people good, accurate medical information, provide broad guidelines like we're doing for our different departments. Within Pierce County, you know, we've got everything from a wastewater treatment plant to a jail, from parks to patrol deputies, from human services, to communications, to think that a one size fits all policy can work across the county in public safe facing departments to non-public facing departments in all those different scenarios doesn't work. That's why what we've got to do is we provide kind of broad guidance to our departments and then entrust them and empower them to make the right decisions at that local level, be it at a building, be it at a course, be it at a facility, to make sure that they are protecting our employees, that they're protecting our customers, the public, 
and they're protecting our communities. It's that same approach, I think, that you free up to get our economy back going again. Um, my concern is that the current approach where everybody's got to go to Olympia to try to make an individual case or an association by association case, that just is, is, is very slow, very cumbersome, and that the, the economic disruption is going to be far worse than the public health benefit. That's, that's my concern. We've got to take care of the public health issue. There's no question. But we've got to do it in a way as intelligently and as smartly as possible, as JT talks about. We've got to, we as elected leaders have to balance the public health benefit and the public health concerns versus the societal disruption. You know, we've got to struggle with that. And that's important, which is why I believe that the kind of the approach is make sure people are smart and trust them to make good decisions on behalf of all the interests that they're responsible for. This question. Way, there's plenty of evidence that that's happened. Uh, 538 uh, just did a, a major uh, data release where they showed that across the country, people distanced before they were required to. So they were they were ahead of the political leaders there. They were smart to do that. And, um, you know, we also saw that uh, even though they're having a lot of difficulty in Yakima, Yakima County was the first county to have a mandatory stay home order ahead of the state of Washington. So these counties that people think of as red counties uh, and, uh, you know, they they are very concerned about their agricultural and food processing industry there. Uh, they made that step. Uh, when it was hard, and they were out ahead of everybody else. So we can do these things at a less centralized level than we're doing them right now. Next question uh, is for JT. I've seen a figure that the state spending has increased about 40% over this biennia and the previous. Aside from K-12, which should not be immune from cuts, where amongst the spending increases uh, can or should the reductions be focused? Well, that's going to take a ton of study, and I, I don't have that answer off the top of my head. And as I mentioned before, uh, a huge part of this now is, um, you know, based on entitlements. Uh, for example, the last recession, the the biggest source of available savings was higher ed, and uh, now much more of higher ed is uh, part of uh, entitled um, financial aid. And uh, so the, the number of places that we can go uh, are quite small. There are parts of K through 12 that is not part of McCleary. And I think that uh, there's going to be a lot of interest in the non-McCleary parts of K-12. And there's an immense amount of dollars tied up in uh, labor contracts that still require significant raises. Uh, for the life of those contracts. And I think that there's going to be a tension there too, since the private sector is so badly uh, shaken at this point. I, I think that the people of Washington are going to demand that, uh, you know, government feel some of this pain as well. Next question is for Bruce. Um, I understand that 30 million went toward business and economic revitalization for Pierce County. Of that 30 million, did any make it to organizations that didn't get help in the CARES Act, such as Chambers and other C6s that are heavily involved in economic recovery and business continuity? That's a good question. And that's one of the things that has come up and, and part of being nimble and why we've got kind of a, a big pot of money there with decisions being made uh, in our economic development group, uh, that team focusing on those. Um, and that is one of the things that has absolutely come up is that there are other kind of organizations, just like in the community revitalization area, we're going to, there are some key nonprofits like our emergency food network and Habitat for Humanity that are key to delivering kind of affordable housing and housing issues and food, food and housing are key, just like that in the economic development and stabilization area. We've got to be supporting those organizations that leverage into our community to support our, our businesses. And so that's definitely going to happen in Pierce County. Next question. Could JT please speak to the lawsuit that was filed on the governor's authority for COVID? 
Well, there's been a lot of them filed. I, I think the, the questioner probably means the one that was filed by a few of my caucus members. Uh, first of all, they paid for that themselves out of their own pocket. That wasn't done with any public dollars. And the people that filed that were out of the heart of the House Republican Caucus. Uh, some of the most uh, business oriented members of uh, my caucus who uh, I think uh, see better than most the devastation that is being wrought right now, which probably cannot be repaired. I, I think that there's a lot of business that will never, ever, ever come back. Uh, and to some people, that's just tax base. Uh, to others, those are dreams that are destroyed, uh, you know, dreams that will never come true in the future and families that are broken up. Because we all know that our family businesses and our small businesses are a part of our soul. And uh, that, that just doesn't get to be part of the discussion very much. And uh, I, I've looked into um, the legality of the governor's orders and uh, the attorneys that I've consulted uh, and I haven't uh, gone to, well, I've gone to ones that I respect a lot and some that are very well known in public. And what I've heard from them is, especially at the beginning of this experience, it's pretty well established that uh, governors have uh, emergency powers. They've been used a lot in the past, usually for natural disasters. And uh, you will not have a good outcome in court. Um, later in the process, especially if you are from a state where uh, your reactions uh, in terms of, if, if you're applying restrictions much more broadly than other states in Washington, and if you are holding on to those restrictions for a much longer period of time without good evidence of why, uh, you have a better chance of prevailing in court. And then I think even the governor has recognized that uh, those lawsuits that proceed based on the second amendment and the freedom of uh, religion uh, are probably gonna win. And you have seen the governor, uh, I think, uh, be a lot less threatening about those uh, areas now and, and probably a lot less interested in enforcement in those areas because uh, there's probably a really good legal case for those that wanna challenge. We'll leave a lot of questions on the table, so I'll just uh, use this as the final question. Um, I don't get why new construction is not allowed. What's the data and science that shows new construction is more risky than public work or projects that were in progress? Well, the uh, the governor actually backtracked on that and is now allowing um, most new construction uh, as long as you started your permits. But there really isn't that there really isn't any difference. If you've put a brick down on your piece of ground and now you can say I'm under construction, what's the difference between that and the day before you put the brick down on the piece of ground. There is no difference. And, and it, it cycles back to uh, everything we've been saying here, um, uh, all three of us, which is let's just have some consistency. Let's focus on the safety. Let's be consistent about how we're applying this to keep ourselves safe. And let's empower the people that are doing the jobs uh, who, who don't want to get sick themselves and want to keep their community safe and their family safe. Um, so I hope to see that uh, that first brick can be placed uh, uh, down here shortly and we can see new, new construction actually get kicked off. So I would just touch bases on a couple of those items in Pierce County. One is, is our permitting application and review system and approval system is all done online. So uh, we, we didn't skip a beat when we went into teleworking other than getting kind of the equipment to people's home. They could log on to the networks. Our permit techs and our engineers were doing their work. We were continuing to process permits and uh, we, we were continuing to do many inspections uh, during the, even during the construction shutdown because we had a lot of essential projects out there and you know both public and private. And I'm really proud of our inspectors right now. Since this construction has been kicked back off, I can remember, I just saw some stats from uh, about a week ago. There was requests for like 774 inspections in one week, and we delivered over a thousand inspections. And that's both, in some cases, that's Skype inspections. In some cases, that's guys showing up on site and our inspectors are very much, when they're out on site, if somebody says, hey, we called you out here to do this inspection, but this work product is also ready for your review, can we get both of them done at the same time, as opposed to 
going back into the queue? And the answer is yes. That's how you do 31% more inspections at the end of the week than were requested at the beginning of the week. You know, I think one of the big differences between the private sector and the public sector is the value of time. And, uh, you know, in, in the legislature, it, the most common thing in the world uh, is for uh, a bill to get killed because we can always do it next year. And, and what happens is that one object, the bill, becomes uh, way more important than the time. But in the private world, both those things are critical. You have to deliver the product and you have to deliver it on time. And uh, we just need to have this sense of urgency in our economic recovery because we know that there is such a short uh, time uh, scope left for small businesses and some large businesses to survive. And uh, a week can mean the end. Uh, and I, I just wanna continually get uh, the executive branch to understand it's what you do and it's when you do it. And uh, again, I, I'm getting a few signs, glimmers of hope, and largely because there's some pretty good uh, private sector organizations that uh, are, are pushing this idea and working with uh, the governor's staff. I want to thank all of you for participating today. Mark, um, as always, it's great, uh, great information that you've provided. The you know, latest publication is in the handout section up in the right-hand toolbar. So before you exit the meeting, you can grab that. Um, Senator Wilcox, uh, thank you for spending the time with us. Executive Bruce Dammeyer, thank you as well. I'm sure we'll be hearing from you again uh, during a, a future uh, virtual solution series event. Just a reminder, next Wednesday, we have the Tri-Cities Happy Hour. It's hosted by our young professionals. That's an evening event, 7 to 8 p.m., but you can uh, register for free. They're gonna, going to be talking about the economic outlook and future of the Tri-Cities and the Hanford area. Then the following week, we'll have uh, Pam Lewison, our Center Director for Agriculture, and, uh, and Maria Frost, our Transportation Center Director, talk about um, their respective centers, the impact of COVID-19 on the ag sector and the transportation sector, as well as some related issues. So you can register for both of those events at the WashingtonPolicy.org page, and those events are, of course, free. Thank you so much for joining us today. If you had a question, we'll try and uh, try and get those questions answered uh, for you at some future time. And I'd like to thank everyone for participating. Thank you.